This is a Whole Observatory podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Welcome to Star Stuff, space oddity. Hi, and welcome to Star Stuff. Uh, this is actually, I didn't tell you this, this is our last episode ever. It is? It is. Oh my gosh. No I know. No pressure then. I know pressure. Just make sure you're funny and charming and really good. Oh, great. Uh, so this is my friend and coworker, Joe Lama, Dr. Lama. Hi, Cody. Hello. And I'm your host, <laughs> Cody Half Moon. Um, so originally, and we can still talk about this. So just just tell the people, what do you study? What do you do here? What do I do here at LOL? Uh-huh. <laughs> so I'm one of the astronomers on staff and uh-huh. I study exoplanets. So exoplanets. I search for planets like the Earth mm-hmm. going around the stars you see in the night sky. Okay, awesome. And a quick question because this is actually something that we've debated or discussed on the podcast. Uh, most of the stars that you see in the night sky have planets around them. Yeah, that's true. So that's one thing we know now is that statistically speaking, every star has at least one planet going around it. And they're but, usually like hot Jupiters, right? No, hot Jupiters are pretty rare. Oh, are they? Yes. Oh, okay. No, uh, hot Jupiters were the first planets we found because they're oh. the easiest to find. Right. But that's a selection bias. And so most of the planets we know of are actually more like the Earth. They're slightly larger than the Earth. They're called super Earths. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Oxygen? Possibly. What? Yeah. Okay. So this is going to lead me into, um, so as I was saying before, Donate, I don't use notes on the <laughs> podcast because um, I'm a professional. I don't use notes. But I'm really excited. Uh, I don't even remember what I told you this episode was going to be You about. told me nothing about this. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so um, I picked John Compton's brain. <laughs> okay. And I got, so this is just a quick, before we get into exoplanets, this is just like a really quick run through and you're just going to say yes you've heard of it and whether or not you think it's a thing okay okay you ready yeah boltzmann's brain i've heard of boltzmann okay do you know boltzmann's brain i do not know boltzmann's brain a brain whose neurons are so arranged that it thinks it's a living observer which can perceive a vast endless universe teeming with stars and planets suggests that it might be more likely just for the development of the big bang and everything like that for a single brain to spontaneously form in a void, complete with a memory of having existed in our universe. Interesting. Isn't that cool? Okay, but you never heard it. Moving on. Last Thursdayism. Last Thursdayism? Last Thursdayism. I have not heard of okay. Last Thursdayism. Last Thursdayism is that the entire universe started last Thursday. But I was at the pub on last Wednesday. Yeah, but that could have been a memory. Interesting. That you were created with. Interesting. I and like, like that. I like that. That's an interesting... Yeah. Isn't that cool? That is cool. It's I quite an interesting like that. thought experiment because like prove it wrong. Uh-huh. uh-huh. I mean also prove it wrong that there's not like a unicorn instead of Nate behind the camera. But right. still could have happened. Interesting. Right? All right. <laughs> um, Rocco's Basilisk. This one I like. I have not heard of this one either. Oh my God. Okay. So... Um, the, the idea it, and it's actually like, I was told that if I talk about it on the podcast that I need to put like a warning, Uh oh. like if you suffer from existential dread, stop listening. Oh, I'm in. Tell me. Okay. Okay. I thought you would be. <laughs> okay. So basically, um, there is a concept or a thought experiment that in the future there would be created this like AI, uh, mm-hmm. so advanced, um, and they call it the basilisk and, humans would ask the basilisk what is the best way to like optimize life or like make life better is this ringing a bell uh, not really but oh go on gosh. i can totally see where this is it sounds like a black mirror episode it does a hundred percent it does okay so um and it was by this user named rocco or rocco mm-hmm. um i think people say rocco um and he posted it online on this thought you know this like philosophical message board and the owner of the website shut it down. It was like the stupid, no one talked about this, shut it down, deleted all memory of it. Like, we're not talking about this. Too close to the truth. So dangerous though. Dangerous to think about. And here's the problem. So when we create this AI potentially in the future and we ask it this question, it decides that anyone in history who didn't help lead to its inevitability will be punished and tortured. Oh, wow. So now it's in your brain, 
And if you don't start helping it come to creation, you will eventually be tortured. So the more people who get this uh -huh, idea, uh -huh. like even just sharing the idea, it's more likely that it will come to happen like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Wow. Isn't that cool? That is cool. That is cool. I think we've got a ways to go to get there, but... Yeah, everything I read, they're like, ah, the risks are really low because like we can all just agree, like don't make the basilisk. Yeah, don't but that, do one, it. that one person. The one person. Yeah, could be you. And, it, and if you don't help it, mm. you will be doomed to eternal suffering. Think about it. Anyway. I'll think about that later. That, That's going to keep me favorite. awake tonight. I know. And it's just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other one I have, okay, this is the last silly one. <laughs> I And John, John Compton might have been making this up. The single track Bohemian Rhapsody trolley problem. The single track Bohemian Rhapsody. Rhapsody trolley problem. I know of the trolley problem. Okay. So you have the trolley problem where it's like, you know, you the can one turn versus, the trolley yeah, 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 versus yeah, many. Yeah, yeah. So this is a single track. They're all going to go okay. to the basilisk. of so. But you have the choice of either playing the Bohemian Rhapsody or not. Oh, wow. And that's the only moral decision that you can make. Well, as a Brit, I feel like I have to say you would play Bohemian Rhapsody. Right. And that's the last thing that you're, these people are doing. I mean, it could be worse. It could be worse. I guess it could be worse. Okay. And then the, um, the, that was the last like weird one, but I had to ask you about it because you're British. I mean, come on. Uh, single photon double slit experiment. Uh-huh. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so are you familiar enough with, with it to explain it? It's been a while, it's been a while. Uh, since I did my physics undergrad. Right. Yeah. It, oh, was this included in your? Yeah. Oh, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's it was. Um, so it's the is the light a particle or a wave, right? Yes. And does it respond? Does it is it a particle or a wave? Like, does it choose to be one or the other? Right. Whether or not it's observed. Right. So, and I think we might have we described this on the podcast before. I think we might have, but mm -hmm. basically, you have two slits in a board. Yep. And you shoot a single photon through it. Yep. And it will reflect on the back if it's several lines. Yep. Um, you put light through it and it's several lines. It's mm -hmm. a wave because the light bounces Correct. off each other and makes this pattern. Correct. Um, where it, What's that called? Uh, where it's... That's interference. Interference yeah. pattern. Yeah. Right. Um, and so then they shot a single photon through and it still made the interference pattern. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why? Right. It shouldn't be interfering with anything. Right. Because it's a single photon. Right. So then they put sensors on the slits to see which slit it was going through. And oh, when interesting. it did that... Okay. It shown on the back is just one line. That bit I had not heard before. Yeah. Okay. So they're like, wait a second. Why is it different yeah. when we put this sensor on it? Mm -hmm. So then they put the sensor and they uh, turned it off. So the sensor was there, but it was off. And there was an interference pattern again with one photon. Mm -hmm. Then they took the sensor and they hooked it up to a computer in a different room and collected the data. Single photon, one line. And then they made it so that it would go into... Uh, a rubbish bin, as you would say. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm translating Thank for you. Thank you for translating you are so welcome. for me. <laughs> <laughs> a bin. <laughs> and uh, it would be permanently deleted and no one could see it. And the interference was there. Was there. Interesting. And then they made it so they could then recover the data. Wow. And then it was just a single. So it's like, is light sentient? Is it code? Like what, what would explain this? Yeah. I mean, that's a great, uh, this is verging on quantum mechanics, which okay. is way outside of my area of smart people than I study uh, quantum mechanics. But you study so it's a light. Little, it's a, well, I do study light. That's right. How can you trust it? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I got to trust something, right? If it's different when you observe <laughs> it. I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's a bit like Schrodinger's cat, right? Is it, it is. Yeah. Is it alive or dead? But it's dead when you check on it. So how do you know? How do you know? Yeah. yeah. And and it wasn't that actually an ad absurdum um argument was it like almost like a satire argument schrodinger's cat yeah i think so right yeah that's really good yeah and then <laughs> so the last one i have is uh niburu. niburu niburu okay this one this one we have to talk about okay so um because it's interesting and it's part of popular popular culture uh-huh um so it's supposed to be <laughs> A disastrous encounter between Earth and a large planetary object. Okay, okay. Nibiru. 
Uh-huh. So, I've not heard of it, but okay. So every time, like I want to say even you did, we did a press release with something that you were involved in last year. Yeah, we found a new exoplanet. You found a new exoplanet. Yeah. Did you name it Llama? We did not name it Llama. That's dumb. Ah. Um, you <laughs> Take that have. up with the IAU. I will. I'll take a lot of things up with the IAU. Um, but we actually got a lot of comments even on our social media. It was like, what's this mean? Like, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Was okay. this this big planet that's going to crash into us? Wow. What's so, the likelihood? Uh, very, very small. Oh. So the Milky Way is on a collision course with Andromeda, mm-hmm. but the density is so low that there's a very minimal chance that we will actually collide with another planet. So I wouldn't be too worried about that, yeah. Because everything's so as far cool away. As, as cool as that would be, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Are, um, are the planets that you're studying, they're in our Milky Way, though? Yes. Because yeah. we can't see. No, so there have been tentative detections of an exoplanet in another galaxy, Nibiru. but... Nibiru. there you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's uh, what we study, are the planets much closer to home. Okay, so what was the one that you found last year? So we found a planet going around a star that's very bright, kind of like the sun. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the planet was slightly larger than the Earth, so again, one of these super-Earths, potentially in the habitable zone. So potentially somewhere where liquid water could exist, which is really cool. Really? Yeah, yeah. I remember a graphic that Nate made Mm -hmm. for it. Was that with NAU? You made like a graphic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, a little animation. Yeah, a little, yep. it was like a little animation. Yep. Um, so. Ah, so that was for a different planet. We actually had two. Uh, that one we did not. And discover. here I joke about you just traveling all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, We're actually no, that's out here right. discovering yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. No, okay. that, that system is super cool. That's a very well-known system. That's uh, the 55 Cancri system. Cancri? C-A-N-C-R-I, like cancer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not like cantankerous. But, no, okay. like, like cancer. And uh, and so 55 Cancri E, which is the fifth planet in that system, is a really small planet that orbits its star in like 12 hours. Oh. So it's really close to its star. And it's actually the smallest planet that we've been able to measure the alignment of how it orbits around its star from mm-hmm. the ground. And what's the likelihood of it being in that? A habitable zone. That is not in the habitable zone. That planet is very, very hot. I forget the actual... Hot, but it's the fifth furthest. Fifth, well, no, it was the fifth one discovered. Oh, It's actually okay. the closest one to the star. Okay, okay. But we number them in terms of discovery date. So we I don't understand. have to, we don't have to renumber things. That makes sense. As we find more planets closer in. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some, I mean... I guess it wouldn't have to be the closest to the sun because right. Venus is the hottest planet in our system. Right. Even though it's not closest. Right. But if you were on an, another star doing what I do, looking at our sun, you'd probably find Jupiter first. Right. Which it's is not a hot Jupiter. Right. Yeah. Which just yeah. make it make sense. Yeah. Well, we owe a lot to Jupiter, actually. So Jupiter shields us from a lot of stuff coming in from the outer solar system. Explain. <laughs> and so, well, so because it's a large body in the solar system, a lot of stuff gets attracted to Jupiter. She's and so, sick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, it actually really helps us maintain where we are and not move in and not get bombarded by other stuff. And so life on Earth does have a bit of a role thanks to Jupiter. So would you say that our orbit is affected by Jupiter's presence? Not so much affected by it, but it's protected by it, if really? that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And so it is just getting, like, pummeled by stuff on yeah. the other side? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there that could have impact us, but Jupiter is shielding it. But only, like, a, you know, I guess depending on which way it's flying. Yeah, sure. Because we're not in... Right, so we don't. Same. it doesn't completely protect us, but it definitely helps. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, take that up with the conspiracy. Right, theories. right, right. And um, I'm also curious, so you're you're researching and you're discovering these awesome planets, which, like, that's pretty cool, Joe. Um, I'm curious, when you're looking for things in the habitable zone, mm-hmm. is it accurate then to say that the search for life is a scientific measured calculation and search that's being done in serious sciences, or is it not? Oh, no, absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, I think one of the biggest questions that we have at all levels of interest, you know, from popular science through to genuinely how did the solar system form Mm -hmm. is how common is life in the universe. And so, yeah, yeah, we're trying to answer that in a very serious way. Absolutely. 
And how um, how is your search aiding to that by so, finding these rocky habitable? Yeah, plants? so what we do very well here at Lowell is we find the planets that are in the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. For then, for missions like the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's next big flagship, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, to go and actually characterize. I'm sorry. Yeah, to actually go and characterize the atmospheres of those planets. The Habitable World Observatory. Observatory. HWA will be NASA's next big flagship. The Who? successor to James Webb. Yeah. Who? <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait. So can you explain this project? Because I have not heard of it. Yeah. So it's still in development, but essentially NASA is so serious about Is it who? Is it seriously like it's HWO. Did they do that on purpose? Like who? I think it's I maybe. Who knows? We're gonna go with that. <laughs> yeah, it's NASA's next big flagship and it will try and characterize the atmospheres of these small planets that missions like Express on the LDT that we work with here at Lowell mm -hmm. are finding. So is the purpose to find Earth number two for when we eventually go nuclear here, or <laughs> is it to find some friends? No, it's to find, I, I don't know about friends, but uh, <laughs> for us to get to one of these planets would be such a long mission. You know, I don't, I don't think that's on the cards, right. but I do think it'll help us understand our place in the universe. Like... Mm. Mm -hmm. How, you know, I certainly don't think life is unique here on Earth. No. But how common is it? Um, it's something we don't know the answer to. So we've we've definitely talked about this on the podcast before. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten into, um, oh, what's the what's the equation? The Drake equation. The Drake equation. Yeah. Um, in, and I know that it's somewhat dated. Yeah. Right? How accurate, how close were they, though? When So the Drake equation being... Looking at the age of stars, right. looking at... Right. So the Drake equation tells you how many, in theory, it tells you how many habitable planets there are. Mm -hmm. And so it requires numbers like A to Earth, which is the frequency of Earth-like planets mm -hmm. in, the solar, in the universe. Yeah. We don't know that number very well. Mm -hmm. We're learning that number now thanks to these large exoplanet missions like Kepler and TESS that are going and finding all these these habitable planets. I'm sorry. Yeah. And so... What is TESS doing? Oh, so TESS is an all-sky survey, the, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And so it literally monitors the entire sky finding small exoplanets that we then go and measure the masses of with instruments like Express on the LDT. And so the Drake equation is correct, except that the numbers that go into it have these huge uncertainties that we don't know. And what's the area called where there's most likely, at least that Drake thought when they sent the Arecibo message? Yeah, so I think that's probably, I don't, I'm not sure, but I think it's focused on the most populous region of the, the galaxy, which is the center disk. So towards the center of the Milky Way, towards the area with the most stars would be what I would do anyway. The black hole? Near the black and there's hole. a lot of stuff between us and the black hole. Okay. You know what I learned recently, actually, like in the past, I think on the podcast, was that um, Star Trek, and you know, I'm a huge yep. Star Trek fan, yep. just happens in the Milky Way. Right. It is just in our right. galaxy. The right. entire show right. was just our galaxy. Yeah. Which is crazy. The ga our Milky Way is huge. It's, it's a big place. It's a very big place. And there's not a lot of stuff in it. Surprisingly, right. yeah. Right, and on our little spiral arm, we're somewhat centrally located. Yep. Does that put us in a good position to look for habitable planets? Yeah, it lets us look at a lot of stars. If we were much closer in, it'd be very hard to, you know, individually pinpoint stars. But where we are, yeah, it's kind of a, a nice little little bubble. Goldilocks zone? For planet finding, interesting, sure. So I'm um, I'm also curious, we've talked before on the podcast about just if, say that there is life, um, if you look at the age of our sun, mm -hmm. which is a pop two, potentially, or pop yep. three, so it's been through at least one life genesis, potentially two, mm -hmm. because we have gold and iron and stuff like that, right? right? Um, and we know about the age of our sun-ish, and we know the age of, since the Big Bang, ish, right? Right. right. Um, so according to some calculations, life on Earth started when it could. Right. Um, now, there were a few failed attempts at life, yep. too, I believe. Possibly. Possibly. So, you know, life kind of started, and then it didn't work. And then it started again, and mm -hmm. then, yeah, you know. But third time's a charm, and, and here we are. Um, but that would mean that life 
if it was like, if this was the perfect condition for life, perfect meaning there are billions of other possibilities because yeah. the universe is a big place. Yep. We would still kind of be the older brother. Yeah. Like the likelihood of finding some crazy, intelligent, higher species, right. they wouldn't have had the time. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So a lot of people talk about, you know, oh, you found 5,000 exoplanets, yet you've not found any signs of life yet. And it's because life is kind of temporal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last for the entirety of the star. You know, the star is doing its thing that really impacts the potent the probability of life on a planet. Mm -hmm. And so not only do you have to find the planet in the habitable zone, as you just said, you have to find it at the right time right. where life has actually developed. Well, and so and the yeah. light's hitting your eyes way after right. the thing actually happened. Yep. Yep. The whole like if they yeah, looked at so, us, they would see dinosaurs. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, um, you know, you could be looking at a planet that's completely barren. You're like, well, this we could be have life. looking at a planet that's been destroyed. The right. planet might oh, not even God. be there anymore. It might have been, you know, tidally Jeez. moved in and been engulfed by the star. They already lost the Cold War, yeah. went nuclear, and it's all gone. Maybe. Um, or it, the light hasn't reached us yet, yeah. and it looks like a barren planet, but life is that's teeming. That's right. That's right. In its oceans or yeah. whatever. That's right. So I'm curious if it you found a planet and it was the perfect circumstance, mm -hmm. what stage at life could they potentially be in? Could they be at an advanced stage? Yeah, so we would... <coughs> We would look for biosignatures. So we would look for aerobic activity. So oxygen and... Uh, aerobic activity, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so jazzercise. Look, yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. We'd be looking for the planets with jazzercise classes. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Jeez, aerobic activity. Yeah, so we're looking what for the really... Mean? We're really looking for the thick planets. I don't know uh, why that's not me. <laughs> we're looking for signs of, uh, ac you know, um, oxygen, ozone... Things like that, uh, okay. methane, uh, these these biosignatures that we produce here on Earth. Because you have to look, you have to start somewhere, right? You know, one of the big things we have is there's so many stars in the universe. Life could be of any form, but we have to start somewhere. And so the way we're take, tackling it is you have to look for life like our own. And so we're looking for these classic biosignatures that we know the Earth produces. So, but what about our ancestors that were still in the oceans? Yeah, so they would, in the oceans is, is an interesting one, but I think there would still be ozone activity and oxygen in the atmosphere, probably. And you can find that based yes, on what you're doing. Based on what we're doing. So we look at a spectrum of the planet. We look at absorption features that are caused by the presence of molecules in the atmosphere. How like the heck do you do that? Using very complicated uh, machinery that is above my pay grade. <laughs> The LDT. The LDT. Okay, yeah. but you work on the LDT. We do, we do, and so the LDT is like the the camera lens, and then the camera itself is this spectrograph called Express that we have on from Yale University that is really good at splitting light into its constituent wavelengths and seeing these molecules like ozone and things like that. How can you tell when a light has is going through an ozone? So it absorbs. And so if you have a molecule of, say, a certain type, like ozone, and light goes through it, it'll block at a particular wavelength. Mm -hmm. And we have reference wavelengths from the labs here on Earth that we know, okay, if you see an absorption feature at this particular wavelength, then you know oh. that corresponds to this particular molecule. So what did your planets have? Uh, we haven't done those studies yet. What we're more focused on, we're waiting How for... How can you wait? Yeah, well, we're waiting for James Webb to do it. So Express doesn't actually do those sorts of measurements. Oh, okay. What Express does is it actually measures the mass of the planet itself mm -hmm. using the same technique, but in a mm -hmm. different application. And then instruments like James Webb, you really need to be in space because the Earth has ozone in its atmosphere. So right. it's really hard to find ozone on another planet when you've got ozone in your own planet. Mm, ozone. Yeah. So... Are you coming up to have a project on uh, Jimmy? On Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> on James Webb? Uh, not necessarily us, but we are certainly, you know, providing potential planets for people to go and study with James Webb. That's kind of our contribution. Okay. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't be like, you know, you're, you have the joystick for the web. It would be. No, I wish. That would be cool. <laughs> that would be yeah. cool, right? Yeah. Um, so what, I guess, are you studying right now? What yeah. You, what's your current project? So right now I'm actually studying our sun uh, of all this talk of other planets. Oh. Yeah. 
You know cool. this. You I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Nice lead. What? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. I'm just over the staying up at night business. Yeah, uh, yeah. My yeah, observing yeah. is during You're the day. You're getting old, Joe. Exactly, it's okay, exactly. It's okay. So Our dear on, Dr. Lama. Yeah. <laughs> so what we do is we study the sun using the same spectrograph, using Express. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to find these really small planets, that turns out it's really hard to do, shockingly. Mm -hmm. And so the star itself actually masks the presence of a planet with all this stuff called stellar activity, like flares and coronal mass ejections. Mm -hmm. And all these things you see on our sun, all these other stars are doing that too. Okay. And they completely drown the signal from planets. And so one of the big hurdles- Is it like radioactive? No, no, it, um, it just exhibits the same absorption features and the same patterns as a planet going around it. And oh, so you okay. can confuse yourself, is this a planet or is it stellar activity? Mm. And so what we need to do is understand better how stars behave mm -hmm. in order to kind of remove those signals to find these small planets. Okay. And so what better star to look at than one we can get really up close and personal with, yeah. which is our sun. Right. Because most stars like these are all point sources, right, of light. Uh -huh. Whereas our sun, because it's so close, we can actually image it. We can see, like this table is a great example of this. You can see all this detail that you can't see on other stars. Did that on purpose? Yeah, thanks. I'm glad someone It's a really noticed. good aid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, we have the, um, is it April 6th? The eclipse next year, is it? That's the 8th, isn't the eighth. it? It's That's the eighth. right, the 8th. April 8th. Don't get that wrong. I won't get that wrong. <laughs> well, it's because we're, we, we're picking out travel dates right now. And it's really complicated because yeah. my niece is also getting married. It's this whole thing. But I will be there. Cool. And I think um, you're going to be traveling elsewhere to Correct. observe it. Where yeah. are you going to? I'm going to go down to Mexico to Mazatlan. Oh, you get to go to Mexico. Yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah. I'm going to um, sit on a beach and, and watch the eclipse. Are you observing it as a citizen commoner? Yeah. Or are you going to do any studies? No, I'm going to observe it as a citizen. Oh, um, fun. Okay. Fun fact, though, our solar telescope here at Lowell will not get totality because we don't get that here we in Flagstaff, we're not right? In the line, yeah. We're not, but we will see, I forget how much of an occultation we get here mm -hmm. from Flag. But our solar telescope will observe that. And so awesome. we will see some. The one that I get little dings on? on yeah. The, you know I look at those. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's yeah. fun. So we will get data from the solar telescope. Not sadly for totality, but we will get some occultation, which will be interesting. Yeah. And I know we'll have a few scientists uh, in Waco yep. for our uh, Eclipse Over Texas event. Yep. Um, and we have one. And hopefully you'll FaceTime the rest of us so we can. Oh, yeah, totally. As <laughs> oh, please. As you're drinking your margarita yeah, yeah. in Mexico, <laughs> it's the best time to call you, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I'm really excited. I've never seen an eclipse before. Oh, it's amazing. So I'm super excited. Yeah, for I it. saw my first one in 2016 for the last one that went over North America. Okay. And that was something else. Yeah. yeah. And there's the, I mean, it kind of like little flares come out yeah you get to see the corona of the sun which is this amazing stream of material coming off the sun that just is always happening it's always there but it's so uh the contrast between it and the sun is obviously it's like a million times fainter than the actual photosphere of the sun and so normally you just can't see it it's just drowned out by the light coming from the sun and so when you block you know, almost a hundred percent of the sun's light. Oh my god! This corona gets revealed, and it's yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought it was like a, a um, like an artifact from. No, no, no. It's it's always there. The corona is so the corona is the solar wind, and so what happens is the sun. Y'all pick some cool names yeah, for this stuff. So I the mean. sun is constantly ejecting material into mm -hmm. the interplanetary medium, and so like the reason we get aurora here on Earth is because the sun emits this, this these particles, these these events, the solar wind, through these streamers that are the corona that you'll see during the eclipse. And if some of them impact on our Earth, they in interact with our magnetosphere, get funneled down to the poles, and that causes the Wi-Fi outages. Oh. Wi-Fi outages and <laughs> oh, the aurora. aurora. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I wish we had another hour because I could just ask you how magnets work, like ICP. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me that. I don't know. It's magic. Do, it's, it's magic. Yeah. I have honestly tried to do like a Wikipedia <laughs> deep dive and just like, how do magnets work? Yep. <laughs> like they make fun of that band, but like, honestly, how? Yep. yep. How? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that 
that all affects it. It's just, it's, it's one of those like little magic things to me that I just yeah. like kind of keep in my blind spot. It's like, I can't look directly at it. Yeah. You just accept it works. It's, it's like gravity, you know, yeah. it just, it works. Gravity is a theory. Do you know how often <laughs> we get that too? Oh, really? Oh, I forgot to ask you flat earth. No. Oh, damn it. No. Well, um, those are all my crazy theories, but before, before we wrap up, was there anything just cool that you know about the universe that you want to share? Ooh, I think we touched on it at the start. I think it's that every star that you guys see in the night sky has at least one planet going around it statistically. I think that's an statistically. amazing... Statistically. Statistically. So some stars will have six planets. Others will have none. But statistically... Some will have nine. Some will have nine. Or eight. Or eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, there are billions of stars out there. And so there are billions of planets out there. Man, my joke used to be before last year, I guess, and I knew that you found planets, um, was always like, oh, if I discover a real planet and get back to me. Yeah, there you um, go. But dang it, you did. <laughs> yeah, I can't say that joke anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in your expertise, I would be remiss mm -hmm. not to ask, is Pluto a planet? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah, sure. How so? Because I think it was classified as a planet. I think at the time we believed it to be a planet. Uh -huh. Let it be a planet. It's like fair, like clap. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, um, yeah, and I know that the definition's a little bit wiry to where any oh, celestial that's whole... body not around our sun is also not a planet exactly so maybe my joke still fits it kind of does because <laughs> i think by the definition that w the planets we find are not technically planets right and maybe they would say well they're exoplanets not planets right so discover planet and get back to me i can still say it there you go okay yep. awesome yep. thanks i <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you for being on an episode my pleasure finally. this is great it's been a year of me like plotting it has. to get you on here <laughs> and i'm really excited that you got to be on our last episode yeah that's great um so i mean thanks for tuning in we might have some special audio only um episodes like if you do discover a planet sure we'll get you on here <laughs> uh or you know like um celebrities and such so like stay tuned but We'll be on our Discord. We're always here to answer questions. And it has been a wild ride. It has been two years. That's crazy. Of doing I remember this when podcast. you started this podcast. That's crazy. Oh my God. Yeah. I was going mad because I was editing them yeah. also. Yeah. And it was, uh, I did not do a good job. No, so I'm all, I always tell people, I was like, don't listen to the first few episodes. God, like, skip ahead to where Nate starts. Yeah. It's great <laughs> to see the evolution of this and how, you know, great you've made it. To like 7,000 viewers now. Yeah. I mean, you guys it's do really a great cool. job. Thank you. I mean, it's all Nate's, but thank you. No, I'll, well, I'll well done, Nate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nate. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching all these years. And, um, you know, if you haven't left us a five-star review, why not give us a five-star review? Uh, and if you have any requests for special episodes for 2024, let us know. But otherwise, thanks for tuning in. And, um, yeah, adios. Bye. And that's a wrap on Star Stuff. Wow. Star Stuff! Good Woo! job, guys. R.I.P. We love you, Star Stuff. This podcast was made possible by our members and donors. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our nonprofit in making more digital education like this available, go to lowell.edu slash donate. Thanks for listening.